So our goal today is for you to kind of get some exposure to Dale Carnegie principles, the principles that can help you um, sell yourself and your ideas more effectively. Here is a picture of the founder of our company. Um, he was born in the 1880s and he died in 1955. So hopefully you weren't expecting him here today. Um, you got me instead. He started uh, teaching public speaking classes in 1912. So just a little brief history about our company. He um, had been dabbling in sales, was tremendously successful at it, selling for Armour and Company. Um, but he really wanted to teach. He tried going to some colleges to get hired, and the colleges didn't seem to be interested in him. So he started his own public speaking class at the YMCA in New York City. In 1912 was his first class, October. So we're about to turn 100 years old next year, which is pretty amazing. And it really says a lot about the company, the fact that we have been around this long. It's not kind of one of those fly-by-night organizations. I think he'd be amazed to know that now we are in 80 countries. The number one market for Dale Carnegie training is Hong Kong and Taiwan. In fact, um, in 2002, my husband and I adopted a little girl from China. And part of the tradition when you adopt is to send a gift to the foster family who had been taking care of the child, or the orphanage. In this case, it was a foster family. So I contacted my counterpart. Isn't email amazing? I wrote to Jean Chen and said, would you mind sending, me a, co sending a copy of How to Win Friends and Influence People to this foster family in your language? And she wrote back and said, of course. And she also sent another book how to Stop Worrying and Start Living, which she had just finished translating herself. She sent it to the Foster family as a gift. Isn't that cool? I mean, Dale Carnegie's book is written in so many different languages. Some people will say, is it some sort of religion? No, not at all. It's open to any religions. It's really great training on how to deal with people. These, um, the book was written in 1936. After he was teaching the course for 24 years, he had a um, publisher take the course. And this publisher said, you know, he had this series of little booklets that he had developed. I have a pile of them here somewhere. Um, different booklets on how to deal with people and things like that. And this publisher, Leon Shimkin, came through the class. These little booklets, a series of them. And Leon Shimkin came through the class and said, you know, you really ought to consider publishing those books. And Dale said, ah, who would read them? And he said, well, at least the 3,000 people a year who are now taking your class. So Dale Carnegie penned How to Win Friends and Influence People. They say that he was the most surprised author in history when in 1936 he got his first royalty check for $92,000. 1936, can you imagine? I'd be happy with a royalty check like that right now, let alone in the Great Depression. I mean, that kind of made him the equivalent of a millionaire today. So he instantly went on the list of um, the most eligible bachelors in New York City at that point. <laughs> the most eligible and desirable bachelors. But here we are this many years later, and we're still teaching material from his book. So I have a few goals for us today. I would like you to come away with three E's, that you enjoy the session, that it causes you to um, evaluate your skills and where you feel you are today, and that you leave energized, feeling excited about trying some new things in situations that are going on in your life. Now we're all trying to be, we're all trying to sell something almost daily, aren't we? If you're a parent, that is a consummate sales job. You're always trying to sell your kids on doing what you're asking them to do and not doing, not doing what you're asking them not to do. Yes. Did you pass these out? I put them in the little, um, the little thing in case you didn't have a business card. You could just write your contact information on there. I did pass some out in the golden books. So you may wonder, I mean, if, you're, if you don't really think of yourself as being in sales, how many people in here would say you are in sales? <laughs> if you're a business owner, contractor, we are in sales all the time. In fact, one of the, um, our more famous graduates, Lee Iacocca said, he took this Dale Carnegie course way back when. He said, to this day, I'm a great believer in the Dale Carnegie Institute. I've known a lot of engineers with terrific ideas who had trouble explaining them to other people. It's always a shame when a guy with a great talent can't sell the board or a committee what's in his head. More often than not, a Dale Carnegie course could have made all the difference. So today we're going to work on, we're going to be learning what are some of the principles that Dale Carnegie teaches on how to sell yourself and your ideas. In the golden books that I passed out to each person, right in the front of your uh, workstation there, there are some 3x5 cards. I'd like you to take the um, white 3x5 card or the lighter colored 3x5 card and write down a current situation 
in which you need to gain enthusiastic cooperation. A specific person or group with whom you're trying to improve cooperation or sell an idea. You can choose whether this is professional or personal. Just write down one that's going on in your life right now. Now who in here would like to improve their memory? The folks that don't have their hand up probably already forgot the question, right? <laughs> Okay, so this is the work part of the workshop. We're going to have some fun here. I want you to picture. Now, if I said pink elephant, what do y'all see? A pink you tend to see the picture, right? Our mind is pretty amazing. We say that it's the first thing to go, the whole memory thing, but guess what? I think it's still in there. I think we just need some better tools to access it. So, I'm going to teach you something we call um, a, a stacking method. I'm going to teach you some pictures and we're going to see how we do with remembering it, okay? So don't write this down, just try to concentrate. I want you to see right here on the table in front of me, right here in front of you, Evelyn, right? Yes. Um, there is a baby's block and it's kind of a large baby's block, a building block, you know? In this case it's, it's about 12 inches by 12 inches wood ba baby's block and it has three golden C's on it. You know how baby's blocks usually have an ABC type letter? This has C's on at three on three of the sides, okay? Standing on top of this baby's block is a beautiful crystal vase full of a dozen American Beauty red roses sitting on top of this baby's block. One of the red roses' is stem is broken. It's kind of lopped over like this because hanging from it is a wanted poster. One of those Wild West wanted posters, kind of parchment, paint, you know, real, real old looking, and it's got your face on it, and it says you're worth $10 million hanging on here. Okay, everybody see that picture? What was the first item on the table? Mm-hmm, on top of it? Uh-huh. And? Very good. Okay, so as you look closer, thank you, as you look closer at this picture of you wanted, well, you see why, because in the picture you have on a pair of boxing gloves, um, those, you know, red, what's that company that makes the boxing gloves, they say on it? Everlast, yeah. So it says Everlast, red boxing gloves. And um, suddenly the picture comes to life. And you see what you did with those boxing gloves. You all, uh, most people in the room are old enough to remember Mr. French. Remember Mr. French from Neil Buffy and Jody? He's a butler. What more current show for you younger folks in the room would you, would, what, what, what butler? Is there a butler named Jeffrey on some TV show? Oh, yeah, from the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Yes, 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 yes. So there's a couple butlers. Okay, so what happened was you had these boxing gloves on and you hit Mr. French or Mr. Jeff, whatever his name is. You popped him in the nose. He fell backward like a Lipton iced tea commercial straight down to the floor. Okay? Other old folks in the room remember the Lipton iced tea commercials where they fell backwards. Donna, you don't remember that? Okay, so he fell backwards onto the floor and suddenly running up to him was a friendly little, little puppy because in his teeth he had some theater tickets that said admit one in his teeth and this friendly little puppy comes running up to him and wants to steal the tickets. I know you're looking at me like I'm crazy. You're thinking, how long am I in this workshop for? Okay, what was the first item on the floor? Trust me, you're going to remember these on the table. The block, the three C's, thank you. As much detail as you can remember. On top of it? Uh huh. Thank you. You know, if you say it out loud, you'll be more likely to remember it. And what's hanging from it? And and who's on it? And what are you worth? Okay. And suddenly it comes to life. Who'd you bop? Jeffrey or the butler, right? Okay. And what's he got in his teeth? Ticket. Uh huh. Very good. And then who comes running up to him? <clears throat> a friendly little puppy, right? He's wagging his tail and he's trying to get those tickets out of his mouth. Okay, you guys doing all right so far? A yeah. few more additions to this picture. So this puppy has on a collar and for his dog tag it's a sign that says yes, yes. Okay? Now, m munching on the puppy's, the, the uh, tail of the puppy, there is um, some, a set of those wind up chattering teeth and it's trying to bite the tail of the puppy. It's kind of hanging there from the, from the back. I had a set, but I think I failed to bring them with me. Now, screwed into the back of the chattering teeth, there is a light bulb, and it's flashing off and on, no, on and off, on and off, this light bulb. On top of the light bulb, there's a little miniature tripod, and it has a, micro, uh, a telescope, and if you look through the telescope, you see Abraham Lincoln, Honest Abe Lincoln, at the end of the telescope. All right, how you doing so far? Are you getting lost? Okay, what's on the table? Okay, what's on top of it? Uh huh. Okay, lopped over. 
poster. Yeah, you're worth ten million. That'd be nice. You got boxing gloves on. What kind? Everland. What color are they? Red. Very good. Who do you hit? Butler. The, butler. <laughs> the butler, right, Mr. French. And, and what's he got in his mouth? Theater Two tickets. tickets. Who comes running up? A little puppy. Uh huh. Yep. And what's on his collar? Yes. 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 And what's on his tail? Cheddar teeth. And what's screwed <laughs> with a light bulb? What's it doing? Flashing. It's flashing. Flash. 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 Very good. Well, I even like the action. Oh. Thank you. You remember that part? <laughs> Thanks, Sharon. <laughs> and and what's standing on the light bulb? Uh, telescope. telescope. And who's in it? Abraham. And there's only one more picture to add to this. You guys think you can remember? A sympathy wreath is hanging from that telescope, oh. around that telescope, okay? With Abraham Lincoln, Honest Abe. Okay, you guys ready for the work part? Everybody please stand and find a partner. Let's, let's find a partner you don't know very well. How would that be? Okay. Somebody you don't necessarily work with. So maybe this side needs to come over here because you all don't know, you all kind of know each other. We don't want to be with somebody we know real well that we work together with. So, or you two can just switch right there. You two didn't know each other before, right? So you're good on your side, okay? Everybody have a partner? Okay, one of the two of you put your hand up. Point to the other guy and say, you're going first. <laughs> now, have them go through that list of objects, starting with the baby's block. Okay. Only coach them when they get stuck. See how they do, kind of test your ability to remember it all. Okay, please begin. All right, so how'd you do? Did you do better at this than you thought you might? Who had a partner who did really well at this? I did. She did well. All of us. Okay, I think the first hand I saw up was yours. And who was your partner? I'm sorry, what was your name? Diana. Diana, Diana I have a challenge for you oh. with a big boffo prize. You think you can, you, would you mind standing and going through that list of items? You think you could do it backwards? Wow. Are you, she did well. She really I bet did. you could. You can even stay seated if you want. Let's see how you do. Go oh, backwards. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay. Um, Abraham Lincoln is what you saw through the telescope that had the wreath on it. Okay. That was sitting on top of a light bulb that's flashing off and on that's attached to the chattering teeth mm -hmm. that has a hold of the dog's tail. Very good. Tail, yep. Mm -hmm. Who's trying to get the tickets from, from the butler and his collar has yes, yes. And the butler's laying on the ground and he has, he's laying on the ground and he has admit one tickets in his mouth. Very good. I, I punched him onto the ground with red <coughs> Everlast gloves, boxing gloves. And that picture of me with those on is on the help wanted $10 million sign that broke the stem of the 12 dozen red roses that's in the crystal vase. <laughs> I can't talk without my hands. You're doing great. On top of a wooden um, children's block with three gold C's. Wow. Give her some appreciation. Okay, so I have, I have um, a Hershey's chocolate bar because I've been teaching kids all week, so there's your big boffo prize, Diana. Woo, chocolate. If I wanted no chocolate was in it, thank you. No, I'm curious, did you have your hand up as somebody who'd like to work on their memory? Yes. How'd you do with that? Were you surprised? You did pretty well. That was about nine or ten totally unrelated objects. Now part of this, this key of the stacking is how the objects are attached together. You know, instead of, instead of just, you know, well, remember a baby's block, and then remember a crystal vase of roses, and then remember a wanted poster. We have them all interrelated, so you can see the picture together. Now, it's a little wildly exaggerated, yes, but that's kind of what makes it stick, right? So when, keep this in mind when you're teaching kids, particularly, or teaching anyone how to remember something, it's possible to use this stacking method. Now, we have created a, a memory stack for the first 13 colonies in the order in which they ratified the Constitution. If you'd like to hear that, I'll teach you that. Um, we have one for the first 21 presidents. Those are some we've created, but I've had many students who have created their own memory stacks for how to remember a sequence of things they need to do or their grocery list, something like that. So, if you did better than this, better than you thought you would, put your hand up. If you really don't care, put your hand up. You're thinking, what the heck did I just learn that for? If everyone would please take out this little golden book that I put in front of you. This is yours to keep. And inside, if you turn to the first inside cover, there's that picture of Dale Carnegie. Now, it used to have a picture of him in a suit and tie. 
we kind of joke that this is our Abercrombie and Fitch picture of Dale Carnegie. <laughs> What you can't see is that he's holding two dead pheasants because he's pheasant hunting, but they cut that part out, fortunately. There he is in his little sweatshirt. Okay, turn to the next page, and you will see principles from how to win friends and influence people. Now, what I just taught you are some memory pictures to help you remember some of these principles. What was the first item on the table? Yeah. A block, yeah. right. And what does it have on it? Three C's. Three C's. Three C's. Right. Evelyn, would you mind reading out loud number one? Don't criticize, condemn, or complain. Thank you. Underline those C words to remember that we just learned a baby's block with three C's. Now, it's also a baby's block because it's sort of foundational to what Dale Carnegie teaches. Now, you've probably heard of Dale Carnegie as sort of a rah, rah, sis, boom, ba kind of course. <laughs> we don't teach to be fake, but we do teach that you can look at many of life's circumstances two ways kind of the, half, the glass half full or the glass half empty. I, have, um, I actually worked in an advertising agency downtown Cleveland before I got started working with Dale Carnegie. It was called Griswold. And it was one of the four largest agencies in town. A few, few heads are going up and down. You, you heard of it, remembered it. I will stand before you and tell you that the reason that agency closed its doors in 1996 was because of a very negative person they hired to run the creative department. I'm not going to name names. I don't even remember what his name was. He was from Michigan. He came there to run our creative department. He was a bad egg. He started just bringing people down. He complained about everything. He criticized our people and what they wore and if they were fat or skinny. or He was just unbelievable. And you know what? The leadership didn't do anything about it, and they let him continue to run the creative department. So guess what happened? Good people started leaving, taking with them good accounts, because nobody wanted to work with this guy. He was really, really just one of the you know, biggest complainers and whiners I had ever heard of. He complained about our clients all the time. Well, guess who pays the bills? You don't want to be complaining about your clients. So I would say that he just spread negativity through our company, kind of like a cancer. Good people left. They took with them good clients. And the agency closed its doors. It had been around since about 1911, I believe, and closed its doors in 1996. Rob Falls ran Falls Griswold Advertising, which was a PR firm next door. And he said it was one of the saddest days when the um, construction crews came through with big bins to throw out all the stuff from Griswold because now a bank was taking over this space. And he was throwing, they were throwing away beautiful crystal, crystal awards that, that Griswold had won, international advertising award, awards that we had won that were just going in these garbage bins. It can really be a huge detriment to your company if you let negativity creep in. So I actually have this one as my first slide, or, or my, the, the first most important principle up here. Because I think if you are trying to sell yourself or sell an idea, don't be that kind of person. The most positive people are the ones that people want to do business with. I had the um, advantage of working for Walt Disney World one summer when I was in college. And I had worked in retail before, back in my high school and college days. In fact, Jamie Hart, who was supposed to be here, was my boss at Jean Nicole Retail Store at Parmatown Mall way back when. She's not, she was on the list but didn't show. Um, and I knew that people could be really negative working in retail, always complaining, you know. Have you ever gone up to a cashier and said, how are you today? And they say, ah, oh, I'll be better in 20 minutes when I get to go home. Well, when you work at Disney, they teach you as part of their guest relations class. You never complain on the job. You are not allowed to complain on the job. It is not tolerated. In fact, we will send foxes through our park. And they will be there to test you. And they will ask you some questions. And they might try to give you a little bit of a hard time to see how you respond. If you respond in any kind of a negative way, they are empowered to fire you on the spot. Now, that could be seen as management by intimidation to some people. If you were really paranoid, you'd be looking at everybody who comes in your store or your, or your attraction wondering, is this a fox? To me, I loved it because I wasn't a very, I wasn't a complainer. However, I did let other people pull me down and kind of, you know, grab onto me and pull me into that, that quagmire of complaining once in a while. But when I got to work in an environment where nobody was complaining, it was so fun. So principle number one in this book, I'd like you to take, make a check mark if that's one that you could work on, that you could be a little better at. I have a quote from Abe Lincoln, any fool can criticize and most fools do. It takes a wise and loving person to be understanding and forgive. Okay, what was the next item on top of the baby's block? A, vase. a, crystal. a crystal vase, right? Mm-hmm. How many? 
Well, Very good. Okay. Um, principle number two. Donna, would you mind reading that? I don't mind. Give honest, sincere appreciation. Underline that word appreciation, and then you might want to write next to it roses to remember that that picture, you would give roses to someone that you appreciate, correct? Dale Carnegie said the best way to crack the nut that is hard to crack is to soften it with honest, sincere appreciation. Um, so when I worked at Griswold, we had a great traffic manager. I don't know if you guys have traffic managers in your companies, but they're kind of people who are maybe a project manager responsible for getting a project th through and out the door on time. So she would have dates, deadlines, all that, and she was in charge of making sure that it went through. So I love my traffic manager. Her name was Mary Ann. She was really good. She'd come in my office at about 5.30, quarter to 6 every night and say, is there anything else I can do for you before I go home? Most traffic managers would have split at five. You know, she was just one of those good eggs. I loved her. And I was talking to my boss once. I said, I said, you know, Marianne is just one of the best traffic managers I've ever had. And he said, you know, she really is good. And I go, well, you should tell her that sometime. He goes, no, I don't want to do that. She'll want more money. So, what do you think happened to Marianne? Bye. Yeah, she ended up leaving. You know, within a few months of that conversation. Not because it, she was going to go get more money at this other place, really because she felt underappreciated. Anybody in here feel overappreciated today? <laughs> if you're a parent, you really don't feel overappreciated, do you? <laughs> Appreciation is something that we can give and it's free and we can be generous about it. You know, we all have customer appreciation type, well, retailers have customer appreciation days. Sometimes appreciation is just something as simple as a little note. If you're selling yourself and your ideas and you have a customer who bought what you, what you sold them, a little note just saying thank you so much, it means so much, it means the world to me that you're doing business with us and we'll do our best to fulfill your expectations. Something like that. It's free, it doesn't cost money, but it can really mean a lot. In fact, I, I recommended to the kids I was teaching the other day when I was teaching this principle, I said, so you guys go out to dinner once in a while, maybe you're with some friends, and you're a little short to leave much tip, as much tip as you would like. You know what I would suggest? Hand write a nice note to the waiter or waitress. Tell them how much you appreciated their good service. Something like that means a lot to waiters or waitresses. So giving honest, sincere appreciation will, thank you, help, help you stand out from the crowd. Now what was... Make a check mark next to that one if that's one you could work on, being a little better at. We all probably could. The next item, breaking down the rose's stem. What was that? The wanted poster. The wanted poster. Diana, would you mind reading principle number three? Arouse the other person in either want. Underline that word want for the wanted poster. Now, I always joke that, uh, that one of the reasons this book became such a bestseller was because it actually had the word arouse in it. I mean, you know, this was 1936. Think about it. But actually, this is one of the original copies of the book. And this is pretty funny. In this book, it talked about... It was a little bit more politically incorrect when written back in 1936. This is one of the old ones. Seven rules for making your home life happier. Want to hear them? <laughs> Number one, don't nag. Number two, don't try to make your partner over. In other words, change them. Number three, don't criticize. Number four, give honest appreciation. Number five, pay little attentions. Number six, be courteous. Number seven, read a good book on the sexual side of marriage. Written in 1936. Can you believe he said that? That doesn't have anything to do with principle number three, but I thought it was funny. That word arouse always reminds me of it. Um, but what he talked about in this chapter is how to arouse in the other person an eager want is really to be a good listener and hear things from their point of view so that when you make your proposal or your recommendation, you can push their hot buttons. Really, the, the magic in learning to see things from the other person's point of view can help somebody be a great salesperson if they're able to try to get into their head and ask more questions. Typically, salespeople come in and just start spraying and praying, you know, telling everything their company can do for somebody and, and really not asking all the questions that they ought to. I had a window sales, salesperson in our, one of our old homes. Um, I had a house built in the 30s in Rocky River, and it had those old beautiful lead windows, you know. And I had bought um, these magnetic storm windows, which were really cool. They popped on the inside. They made a little magnet frame, popped on the inside, so it didn't change the look of those beautiful leaded glass windows. Well, I was in Michigan trying to find the same thing. The guy who, you know, is the contractor who makes those up here, I 
obviously doesn't go all the way to Grand Rapids, Michigan to make them for you. So I was trying to find the same thing. So I invited a window salesman to my house while he brings in his binder, his sales binder. Folks, if you have a sales binder, I would highly recommend you consider coming through the Dale Carnegie sales course so we can teach you how to use it. Not everybody wants to see page after page of your slides as he goes through with, with me on the kitchen table, you know, and here's this and here's that. And I'm like, no, all I want to know is if you sell these magnetic storm windows, you know, well, no, but we have this and that and this. So. That's what, what we suggest is that you really try to ask more questions and learn more about what your client wants or needs and then you will be able to arouse in them an eager want. There's a cute story written um, about, I think Ralph Waldo Emerson wrote it, it's inside Dale Carnegie's book, um, about a boy and his dad, farmer, were trying to get the calf into the barn. There was a storm coming and so there's the farmer and he's pulling with a, with a big old rope and the boy's behind the calf pushing and they're trying to get this thing into the barn and the calf is just digging his heels in. He is not going anywhere near that barn. So um, the wife is up in the farmhouse and she's watching this out the kitchen window. She decides to walk out there. She puts her thumb in the calf's mouth and leads him into the barn with no problem whatsoever. That's how she was able to arouse in the other person an eager want. She knew what he wanted. He wanted something to suckle on, not to be pushed or pulled or prodded. So if that's one you could work on, make a mark next to that one, a star or an asterisk. These first three principles are really fundamental techniques in handling people. What was the next item on the wanted poster? What do you have on? Right. Now we're going to switch over to the next page under Win People to Your Way of Thinking. Uh, Sharon, I think it's your turn, right? Could you read number 10, please? Sure. The only way to get the best of an argument is to avoid it. The only way to get the best of an argument, underline that word argument to remind you of the boxing gloves. Thank you. Ooh, that was loud. So I'm going to tell, I'm going to read a little story from, this is my book, by the way, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Wow. How long do we have? We're here for a couple hours. I'm going to read all my, uh, all my stories to you from here. Um, let's see, on page 145. Dale Carnegie says, you can't win an argument. You can't because if you lose it, you lose it. And if you win it, you lose it. Why? Well, suppose you triumph over the other man and shoot his argument full of holes and prove that he is non compos mentis. Then what? You will feel fine, but what about him? You have made him feel inferior. You have hurt his pride, he will resent your triumph, and a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. Years ago, Patrick O'Hare joined one of my classes. He came to me because he had been trying, without much success, to sell trucks. A little questioning brought out the fact that he was continually scrapping with and antagonizing the very people he was trying to do business with. If a prospect said anything derogatory about the truck he was selling, Pat saw red and was right at the customer's throat. Pat won a lot of arguments in those days. As he said to me afterward, I often walked out of an office saying, I told that bird something. Sure, I had told him something, but I hadn't sold him something. It was a big difference. My first problem was not to teach Patrick O'Hare how to talk. My immediate task was to train him to refrain from talking and to avoid verbal fights. Mr. O'Hare became one of the star salesmen for the White Motor Company in New York. How did he do it? Here is his story in his own words. If I walk into a buyer's office now and he says, what, a white truck? They're no good. I wouldn't take one if you gave it to me. I'm going to buy the Who's It truck. I say, well, the Who's It truck is a good truck. If you buy the Who's It, you'll never make a mistake. The Who's It's are made by a fine company and sold by good people. Then he is speechless. There's no room for argument. If he says the who's it is best and I say sure it is, he has to stop. He can't keep on all afternoon saying it's the best when I'm agreeing with him. Then we get off the subject of the who's it and I begin to talk about the good points of the white truck. There was a time when a remark like his first one would have made me see scarlet and red and orange. I would have started arguing against the who's it and the more I argued against it, the more my prospect argued in favor of it. And the more he argued, the more he sold himself on my competitor's product. As I look back now, I wonder how I was ever able to sell anything. I lost years of my life in scrapping and arguing. I keep my mouth shut now, and it pays. So if you have any sales folks, estimators, people who are going out there representing your company, and they like to argue, I would really recommend you have them read this chapter on how to win friends and influence people. Not saying that any of you folks are arguers, but I think at this point in your careers, um, 
and the season of life you're in, we've come to realize that arguing really doesn't end up helping much in the long run, does it? Doesn't help us to get our ideas across. Dale Carnegie says there are much more powerful and effective ways to get your ideas across. Ben Franklin said, if you argue and rankle and contradict, you may achieve a victory sometimes, but it will be an empty victory because you will never get your opponent's goodwill. Okay, the next item. So where are we? Let's see, you had boxing gloves on. And who'd you hit? Mr. French. Mr. French, who is somebody who um, shows respect, right? Butlers tend to show respect. Is it Richard? Richard, would you mind reading the next principle, please? Number 11. Number 11. Show respect for the other person's opinion. Never say you're wrong. Underline that word respect, and you might want to write the word butler next to it. Thank you, Richard. It goes hand in hand with the principle right in front of it. The only way to get the best of an argument is to avoid it. But showing respect for the other person's opinion by never saying to them they're wrong. I have um, a dry cleaner. I live in Bay Village and there was a dry cleaner who ran great coupons. And I used to go to her because I liked the coupons. They were, you know, it was one of the best, best deals you could get. Um, so one time I walked in and only half of my dry cleaning was done and she said, I'm sorry, it wasn't all done on time. We had a little bit of a problem at the shop. Please come back tomorrow and it should be done, you know, after five. So I didn't get back there the next day. I didn't get back there until like Monday. And so I went in and said, you know, I'm here to pick up the rest of my dry cleaning. Well, this was a different person. This was actually the owner. I had been working with uh, another person who worked there. The owner goes on the computer. She goes, no, go home and check your closets. It says that it's been picked up. And I said, well, I picked up half, you know, I was trying to explain on Friday, half of it was done, it wasn't all done, you know, so I'm here to pick up the other half. She goes, no, my computer says the other half was picked up too. Go home and check your closets. That's how she talked to me. And I said, oh, okay. And I'm thinking, hmm, that's strange. I don't know how that happened. So I called my husband on my cell phone. Honey, by any chance did you pick up the dry cleaning? Now, in 16 years of marriage, the guy has like, picked up the dry cleaning maybe twice. Well, this happened to be one of the times. He said, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you. I stopped by and picked up the rest yesterday. I said, okay. So I hung up with him. I said, I'm sorry, you were right. My husband did pick up the rest. She goes, well, I knew I was right. I never make mistakes. And she walked out of the room. Guess what room I have never walked back into. I mean, I was just teed off. I'm like, do you have to talk to me like that? Couldn't she have set hand a little much nicer way? Something like, well, our record show was picked up, but do me a favor, go home and check your closets. Give me a call if it's not there, and I'll look into it. We do make mistakes sometime. I would have had 10 times more respect for her if she would have talked to me that way. Would have gone home, found out my husband picked it up, everything would be fine and dandy, and she'd still be my dry cleaner. Guess whose business is closed? Is it because she has that kind of personality? I'm not sure. But always showing respect for the other person's opinion and never saying to them they're wrong. Now, is she right? I was wrong, right? I was wrong. He picked it up, so I didn't know. But I didn't appreciate that she told me I was wrong. And nobody really likes to be told they're wrong. So if that's one that you could work on or your salespeople could work on, make a little mark next to that. Just like that guy who was selling white trucks, when he started telling his customers, you're right, whose trucks are really good? It kind of brought the fight all out of them, and now they were willing to listen to him about white trucks. Okay, so that was the butler, so respect, somebody who shows respect. What did he have in his teeth? Tickets. Admit one tickets, right? John, could you read the next principle, please, number 12? You are wrong. Right, underline that word admit to remember the admit one tickets. When you're wrong, admit it quickly and emphatically. I always just like to say, how about Bill Clinton? <laughs> Wagging that finger of us. I did not have relations with that girl. You know, I don't know. In politics, maybe it's better to deny things and come back later. But I know personally I lost respect for the guy. If he would have just admitted it and said, you're right, I made a mistake. You know, I think we all might have respected him a little bit more. <laughs> inside, um, in, inside the book, there's another story on page 165 about an art director who was really trying hard to sell his... Um, designs to a guy who made wallpaper. Since it's kind of along the lines of construction, I'll go ahead and uh, share a little bit from this story, a few highlights. Like I said, we're here for hours, right? I'm going to share all these stories. 
So he was a designer, and he said, I knew one art director who, in particular who was always delighted to find fault with some little thing. I have often left his office in disgust, not because of the criticism, but because of his method of attack. Isn't that true? Sometimes it's not the words people say, but how they say them that bites, that really hurts. Recently, I delivered a rush job to this editor, and he phoned me to call his office immediately. He said something was wrong. When I arrived, I found just what I had anticipated and dreaded. He was hostile, gloating over his chance to criticize. He demanded with heat why I had done so-and-so. My opportunity had come to apply the self-criticism I had been studying about in my Dale Carnegie course. So I said, Mr. Jones, if what you say is true, I am at fault and there is absolutely no excuse for my blunder. I have been doing drawings for you long enough to know better. I'm ashamed of myself. Immediately he started to, to defend me. Yes, you're right, but after all, this isn't a serious mistake. It's only, I interrupted him. Any mistake may be costly and they are all irritating, I said. He started to break in, but I wouldn't let him. I was having a grand time. For the first time in my life, I was criticizing myself, and I loved it. I should have been more careful, I continued. You give me a lot of work, and you deserve the best, so I'm going to do this drawing all over. No, no, he protested. I wouldn't think of putting you to all that trouble. He praised my work, assured me that he only wanted a minor change, and that my slight error hadn't cost his firm any money, and after all, it was a mere detail not worth worrying about. My eagerness to criticize myself took all the fight out of him. He ended up by taking me to lunch, and before we parted, he gave me a check and another commission. <laughs> Isn't that great? I love those kind of stories. There's so many of them in here. It says, there is a certain degree of satisfaction in having the courage to admit one's errors. It not only clears the air of guilt and defensiveness, but often helps solve the problem created by the error. So if that's one you could work on, put a star next to that one. Okay, so where are we in our, in our stack of pictures? I think I'm behind on up here. That was, if you're wrong, admit it quickly and emphatically. Those three principles are really designed to help you diffuse the situation. Sometimes when you're trying to sell something, there is going to be an air of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? When they're, they're leaning toward wanting to go, an adversarial relationship. And so it's just a way to diffuse the situation when you go in trying not to argue, showing respect for their opinion and admitting when you're wrong. You know, because oftentimes we go in to meet with someone, Evelyn, would you mind putting your hand up? And we start pushing and they start pushing back. I didn't say push your hand, push back, but you did, didn't you? Because it's just our natural reaction. It's our human nature too. When someone starts pushing us, we push back. So here are some ways to diffuse that situation so it doesn't feel like you're being pushy. Okay, so who comes running up to the guy with the tickets? A friendly, a friendly little puppy. So Bob, would you mind reading the next principle, number 13? Begin in a friendly way. Begin in a friendly way. Underline that word friendly. Thank you. So instead of coming at them with, their fist, with your fists high, coming at them in a friendly way. And this is where we teach in, in our sales training how to build rapport with your customers, how to build a relationship. Because you know, when things are equal between you and a competitor, a customer is going to end up going with the person they like best. People buy from people. And even when things aren't equal from you, between you and a competitor, maybe your price is up here and theirs is down here. If they like your representative more, they're going to want to do business with you. And before they just buy from this other person, they're going to give this guy, they're going to give you an opportunity to change your price. And, and cons then who's in the buyer's seat? It really ends up being you. You get to decide if you're willing to come down. And isn't that kind of sales euphoria when you get to be the one to decide whether you're going to do business with this company? A lot of it comes down to the likability. People will buy from people that they like. So beginning in a friendly way and having a friendly demeanor when you go in is just a great way for um, anyone to sell. I recently had a guy from uh, Bassett Sprinkler. You guys know Bassett Sprinkler? Anybody hear of that company? They make um, the kind of sprinkler systems that will go inside a, a uh, building for fire control. Um, and he had a young guy that was great in estimating and doing the jobs, but he just didn't know how to build that rapport with people. And he was rubbing their customers the wrong way. And he sent them to one of our, co our courses, and he wrote me the nicest letter back. In fact, I need to put it in this so I can read it. The nicest letter back saying, I cannot tell you what that $1,600 investment has done for this young man. It, the course has already paid for itself, just in his new ability to see, to, to meet with clients and be more positive and build rapport with them and build relationships. 
So beginning in a friendly way is definitely a great way to um, start working with a customer. In fact, I do have a funny little story. So I got a nasty letter once from my uh, pediatrician. It was this letter that was written by some sort of third-party billing company saying, you are in arrears. If you do not pay the amount due immediately, you're going to be sent to a collections agency. I was like, wow, what, am I, what do I do? What, what, how much do I owe? I don't know about this. And it said, the amount due is $10. It was my $10 copay from taking my son to the doctor a few months before. Now, I had never gotten any kind of invoice from my pediatrician, so I was shocked at this letter and a little PO'd. So I sat down to write a letter back. Now, this is, this is what I started to write. We were surprised and disturbed by the letter we, served from, we received from your medical group last week. Upon receiving your letter, I was offended by the derogatory tone and implications made therein. We have been a patient of comprehensive pediatrics for about a year, and I have referred others. Although I do now remember one time that a billing person was so busy, she said, we'll just bill you. I have not received any invoice from your group prior to this offensive notice. I was mad. Could you tell? The reasons we were disturbed by your letter? Your letter is worded as if you had previous communications about this, and I do not have record of or recollection of ever receiving an invoice. I was just there two weeks ago for my son's earache. Why didn't the billing person, upon checking out, simply say, Mrs. McCaskill, do you realize you have a $10 balance due? I would have cheerfully paid it. Are you really willing to risk arousing resentment and offending a good patient with good insurance over a measly $10 balance, which was obviously an oversight, by sending a very poorly designed and worded collections letter that should be reserved for your most delinquent and criminal patients? A friendly phone call would have been much more effective. <laughs> Boy, did I feel good after writing that. <laughs> now, don't we kind of do that sometimes, though, with email? Man, somebody sends you an email blast or something, and you just blast back at them, you know? And sometimes you hit send, and it feels so good. And then afterwards, you're kind of like, oh, shoot, maybe have some sender's remorse. Does that happen to anybody besides me? You know, fortunately, because I've read Dale Carnegie's book many times, as you can see, um, I've read about um, Abraham Lincoln, who was very good at reading and rereading letters before he sent them. Now, this was obviously in the age before computers. He was handwriting them. And if he decided he didn't like the tone of something, he would go back and handwrite it. And they said upon his death, they found many letters in his drawer that he, were, he had never sent. Because after reading them, sleeping on them, he had time to overcome that emotion that he might have felt at the time. So I slept on my letter, and the next day I wrote it a little nicer. I decided to begin in a friendly way. We have been thrilled with comprehensive pediatrics. We love the doctors, the staff, and even the waiting room and excellent service we receive whenever we are there. We were referred to this practice by friends, and we have referred others since. So imagine our surprise when we received the enclosed letter from your medical group last week. Isn't that a little friendlier way to go on to do it? Now, I still went on to make my points because I wanted them to know I thought it was offensive, but I closed with this. I am an instructor of the Dale Carnegie course in Effective Communications and Human Relations, and I feel your representatives would benefit from reading How to Win Friends and Influence People. <laughs> And their collections would probably go up, too. <laughs> then the excellent quality we have come to appreciate would flow through the billing department as well. So beginning in a friendly way, it does help you take the high road and feel a little bit better. <laughs> OK, what was the next item? What was on the doggy's collar? Yes, yes. yes, yes. This little sign said, yes, yes. And we are over here. You're Lauren. Lauren, would you mind reading the next principle? Get the other person saying, yes, yes, immediately. Right. Underline those words, yes, yes. Now, this is, can be seen a little bit as manipulation. Yes, it's true. There is a certain physiological response we get when there's a dopamine release or something like that that happens in the brain when you're saying yes, when you're finding points of agreement. But wouldn't it be a nice way to go into a somewhat adversarial um, meeting, begin in a friendly way, and then start think, talking about the points of agreement where both parties are in agreement. It does start to set a very nice tone for the meeting. So I was at this ad agency out in Denver. I graduated from Bowling Green and moved to Denver for a few years and worked on the Hewlett Packard account. We made a bad error in one of their ads. We ran the wrong 800 number. This is pretty big error when the ad agency kind of screws up and has a typo in the 800 number. So of course, there were no leads generated from that ad, and the client was not very happy. Well, my counterpart, the account executive, said, well, you check the proof to the client. Oh, no. Whoo, probably not a good idea. So there we were on Black Monday, the Monday that we knew Hewlett Packard was coming to fire us. <laughs> I am sure that my, my boss was up all night and all weekend trying to think of how he was going to deal with this. Um, but he was very good. 
he was excellent. He started our meeting off by first apologizing emphatically, admitting our mistake, saying we realize now that we made a mistake. We are very sorry. It is our fault that the 800 number was wrong. We've worked with you long enough to know your 800 number and we will take full blame for this. We will do a make good by running your ad in this publication, this publication, all these publications. We were going to run it for free and pay for it ourselves. Obviously that's what he should have done. Then he started putting up on the overhead projector some of our more successful campaigns we had run with this client over the years. Said, do you remember this campaign? It exceeded our goals. It came in under budget. We got many more. You, got, you, you ended up selling tens of thousands of these computers that you didn't expect to be, se that you didn't think you would be selling. Campaign after campaign after campaign, he showed them our best success stories. The client was now being re reminded of all the good things that we had done for them, and they were saying, yes, I remember that, yes, I remember that. They left, and very fortunately, and probably due to my boss being so smart and so adroit at his human relations skills, they gave us the next um, campaign that they were, the next product they were introducing. And our relationship continued with them. Thank goodness, because that had been that agency's client since the beginning of that agency's doors opening. And they would have really been in a bad place if they would have lost them. So getting the other person saying yes, yes, is another great technique that if that's something you could work on, put a star next to that. Now, what was on the dog's teeth? What <laughs> was on the dog's tail? <laughs> <laughs> I'm not awake today. <laughs> Evelyn, can you read to us number 15, please? Let the other person do a great deal of the talking. Underline that word talking to remind you of the teeth. Now, um, I, I have a, um, a song that some people would probably know. I think it might be on my computer, but I'm just going to sing it for you in the interest of time. So you guys know this Toby Keith song? I want to talk about me, want to talk about I, want to talk about number one. Oh my, me, my, what I think, what I like, what I know, what I want, what I see. <laughs> I know, I shouldn't quit my day job. <laughs> I, <laughs> how's the rest of it go? I don't mind talking about you, but occasionally I want to talk about me, 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 me. Every, who does everybody like to talk about? Themselves. When you get a picture, uh, like a group shot, a family <laughs> shot, who do you look for first? You don't look to see how your spouse looks or your kids look. You always look for yourself first. Oh, how do I look? How's my hair that day? I hope it don't look all messed up. Everybody likes to talk. So letting the other person do a great deal of the talking, sometimes you can get them to talk themselves right into the idea that you're asking them to talk themselves into just by simply asking some good questions. Um, yeah, I'm not going to play you the song since I sang it for you already. But if this is one you could work on, oftentimes, like I said, salespeople will come in and they just spray and pray. Can we be better at getting the other person doing a great deal of the talking? In our sales training, not that I'm here to pitch a course to you or anything, but it would probably do some of your folks a world of good to go through it. In our sales training, we teach them to brainstorm a lot of questions and to bring in a series of questions that they would like to ask a, a potential customer before they do business with them. Customers love to talk about themselves, their business, how they got into this line of work. Just asking them a lot of questions will help build that rapport, but will also help the salesperson discover where their hot buttons are. What are their primary motives, what their buying motives, and other interests, things that need to be part of the deal as you write it back to them. So that's a, a principle that we, I think we all probably can work on a bit, including myself. What was the next item? Screwed into the back of the chattering teeth is? A light bulb. A light bulb. Donna, could you read number 16, please? Yes. Let the other person feel that the idea is his. Underline that word idea to remind us of the light bulb. Now I had a boss at a small ad agency where I used to work um, out in Willoughby called Second Street Advertising and you guys might know the Maroos Brothers Construction Company. This was owned by their sister Sue Maroos Cato. Now Sue wouldn't mind I don't think if I told you this story. She she loves her own ideas and doesn't like other people's ideas so well. So there was a, we had a freelancer who worked for us and the freelancer admittedly was coming in late regularly. Finally Sue said, you know what, I'm done with you. You can't keep working with us because you just, you're, you know, her, ha her work habits were poor. So she fired her. However, I had a client who loved this freelancer. She, they loved her work 
everything, their entire campaign and branding strategy had been designed by this freelancer and they were going to be crushed to find out that we didn't have her working with us anymore. So I had to figure out how am I going to continue this relationship, you know? So instead of going in and saying, Sue, we still need Patsy for this freelance, this project that we're doing for such and such campaign, Instead, I decided, you know, I had learned that she kind of needed it to be her idea. So I went in and started asking her some questions. And I said, what do you think we should do about, I think it was Lincoln Electric, what should we do about this Lincoln Electric idea? You know, this, this campaign that we're working on for them, we've got this big project due. And she said, oh, who was the art director on that? Because we did have other freelancers that worked with us. And I said, it was Patsy. She goes, oh, hmm, let me think about that. I said, okay. So I left. I didn't say, how about we hire her? If I would have, it would have killed the idea, and I had learned this about her, so I left. A few hours later, she came by my office, and she goes, you know what I think? I decided to go ahead and call Patsy and see if she would still be willing to work with us on this one project, because I know how much that client loves her. Did I get credit for that idea? No. Do I care? No. I wanted my client to be happy. And that's really ultimately what it comes down to oftentimes. And you all are seasoned enough to know that many of your good ideas have been implemented and you didn't get credit for them. Is that okay? Sometimes. Obviously not every time. You do want a little credit along the way. And if you're a boss, you want to make sure your people are getting credit for their ideas. But sometimes the only way to sell somebody an idea is to let them think it was theirs. So keep put a star next to that one if that's one you could work on. Where are we now? I, I, I start getting lost after I get a, beyond about number. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so that was the idea. What was on top of the light bulb? A telescope. A telescope, right. And where are we now? Is it Sharon's turn or Richard? I forget. Who's, who's reading? Diana, sorry. Could you read number 17, please? Try honestly to see things from the other person's point of view. Remember who was in the telescope it was? Honest Abe Lincoln. So underline that word honestly and seeing things from the other person's point of view. Dale Carnegie said if you get nothing else from this book than the ability to, to begin to see things from the other person's point of view, then this book will be worth its weight, weight in gold. So Sometimes when you're going in to sell something to a team or a committee, there are different people in the room and they all have their own agenda, right? They might be the finance guy and he's got money as his agenda. There might be the president and they've got their big vision and their dream and their goals for this company as their agenda. Your salespeople would do well if they really thought about who all the parties are and what makes them tick. What is their dominant buying motive? And uh, that idea that, I, that you indicated that you'd like to sell, it would probably do you well, too, to look at that from that person's point of view before you go in trying to convince them. Trying honestly to see things from their point of view. So um, I mentioned that my, do my husband and I adopted a little girl from China. Well, it actually kind of goes hand in hand with the next one. What was hanging from the telescope? Sympathy wreath. The last principle, let's all read it together. Be sympathetic with the other person's ideas and desires. Three quarter of the people you will meet are hungering and thirsting for sympathy. But if you don't know what their point of view is, you never really will know. So I mentioned that we adopted a little girl from China. About the time we were waiting for our, our referral, um, there was a big story in the plane dealer, the Sunday section. Remember they used to have that um, weekend magazine, what was it called? I can't remember. Now it's like Parade, but back then, but back then it was their own. It was a Sunday magazine, I think, yeah. And on the cover was a picture of a little girl being adopted from China. And, and um, it, the title of the story was Saving Grace. And it was written by Danny Marinucci Altieri, who went to China with her younger brother to adopt his, their younger brother's baby, leaving the younger brother's wife at home with their other kids and her husband at home with their other kids. So she got to go with her little brother to go adopt his baby. It was a beautiful story. I still get teary-eyed talking about it. It was full of beautiful pictures and about this wonderful journey to go adopt this baby. Well, two weeks later, of course, the letter to the editors. Somebody has to just shot, shoot holes into that whole story saying, you know, why are all these people adopting from foreign countries when we have so many babies here? Well, maybe that's true. I don't know. God led them to adopt from China and us too. So we did, you know. I don't know why, why, why it happened. But then this person went on to say 
they're just a bunch of yuppies. The mom's too busy with her career, probably. Well, I knew the mom was a stay-at-home mom, so she didn't want to have to get pregnant again. I mean, this person just had all these negative shots. They were taking stabs at this couple. Now, this was a beautiful couple who had done a beautiful thing. I couldn't believe somebody sat down to write that. So, of course, I sat down on my computer. Here we go again. I had the email address of the editor this time. Email is dangerous because you're probably going to hit send. You don't have to lick it and put a stamp on it and put it in the mail, you know? <laughs> You might just hit send. This time, though, I did sleep on it, fortunately, and thought about it and really put together a nicely written letter. Because uh, that night when I slept on it, I thought about, you know, so we're going to have a baby soon from China. I am going to run across people who have lived through wars I've never lived through. My dad told me there was one time in America where anybody who was Asian was put in a camp because they were seen as an enemy. I need to try to be sympathetic with their point of view because I'm going to be encountering it myself. So I changed my letter. At first I, w I wrote something like I was angered by this letter written by this person. How could she take such shots at a divine action as, as adoption? And I changed it to I was really saddened by this letter because I realize that there are going to be people in the world who aren't happy that I've taken a baby from another country. You know, it changed my whole point of view so that I was a little more guarded when I'd be at the grocery store and little elderly people might be giving me a dirty look. One time I had an elderly woman come up to me and I wasn't sure what she was going to say. I have this little Chinese infant with me. And she said, is your baby from China? And I said, yes, she is. She said, well, God bless you. When my husband and I were there, I know I was ready to cry. When my husband and I were there in 1982, they were drowning their baby girls in the Yangtze River. I thought, oh my gosh. So anyway, sorry to get all clumped on you. Be sympathetic with the other person's ideas and desires. This is what you all came here for, right? How to learn to be a more persuasive communicator. Now, Dale Carnegie says, if you really want to move an audience to action, whether your audience is one single person or a group of people, the best way to do it is not to tell them what action you want them to take and then back it up with evidence, but instead to tell a story that demonstrates the action you want them to take and then tell them the action that you want them to take. You know what I mean? So let me clarify. So for instance, if I said to you, you know, Donna, this Christmas Eve, you really ought to go volunteer at a homeless shelter. It was, I, we, we did this once, and it just worked out so well for my family. You ought to do it with your family this Christmas Eve. And so my posture is this. Yeah, you're like, don't be telling me what to do on Christmas Eve. I'll do, you know, we have our own family traditions. But what if I came to Donna instead and said, I got to tell you about my family's last Christmas Eve. We worked through our church, had Interfaith Hospitality Network that, that um, they were hosting a couple of families who were homeless. And you know, my kids, that list, their, that year, their Christmas list was a mile long. And we decided, you know, we really ought to go do this. On Christmas Eve, after having dinner with our family, we went to church and we helped host the, the two homeless families that were there. And we got to meet these little kids, these two moms who were there with their kids. And we got to meet their little kids and my little kids got to play with their little kids. And it was just a magical time, a wonderful time. And so while the kids were off playing, my husband and I got to talk to one of the moms. One of the moms didn't talk very much. She kind of stayed off on her own. But we were talking to the other mom and she was saying, man, I never expected to be in this position. At 26 years of age, I bought my own house. But then the 2009, when all those bank loans went bad that had like balloon things in them, I don't even know what it all was, all of a sudden her house got um, foreclosed upon and she found herself homeless with two little kids and she was so heartbroken. She said, I swore I would never let this happen to me. I had bought my own house. So we brought little webkins. You know what webkins are? They're those little stuffed animals that if you have children, you can go on, the, your children can go online and create little webkins world for their stuffed animals. So we brought little webkins for the four kids that were there and presented to them in little gift bags. The kids were so excited and elated to have these. I'll tell you, that night when we went home and my kids the next morning saw this mound of Christmas presents, I think this incident having them go volunteer and meet with these homeless kids just gave them a whole new great appreciation for what they had. The next day my daughter said, I have so many toys now, Mom, let's take some of these toys in my toy box and put them in a box and get them to those families that needed, ki needed toys for their kids. We decided we couldn't really give them to them because they were homeless, right? So we did donate them to Goodwill. The action I'd like you to take is if you have a family with abundance, and kids who have Christmas lists that are too long, consider taking them and meeting them some, with some homeless families through Interfaith Hospitality Network. Spending some time with them this Christmas Eve just might help your kids count their blessings. 
So, do you think it was a little more convincing? You made me think it was my idea. Ah, okay. But I was able to probably at least get you to listen to my idea, even if you have your Christmas Eve tradition. Well, you might not do it on Christmas Eve, but maybe you'll take me up on the idea to go do something like that, right? Because the story is the evidence that sells the idea. Our research says that good leaders are also good storytellers. Same deal with salespeople. Good salespeople are good storytellers. So what I'd like to ask you to do now, back to the work part of workshop, I'd like you to take a minute now, and the idea, or the, the incident that you just wrote, a time where you either used or grossly violated one of these principles, I would like you to position this as a little story, and you're going to sell your partner on why they ought to use the principle that you either used or grossly violated. You know what I mean? So if we take my story, what was my incident? Christmas Eve, working with these, getting to know these families. What was the action I wanted you to take? Volunteer. Consider volunteering and spending time with homeless families. And what was the benefit I said you might achieve if you did so? Your family might feel blessed by abundance or something like that, I think is how I worded it. I meant to word it if I didn't. <laughs> so this is what we call the magic formula. Dale Carnegie says to start with your incident, start with your story. And then close your story with the action you want your partner to take and the benefit they will receive if they do so. This is the with them in sales. What's in it for me with them? What's going to be in it for them if they take the action you're recommending? A lot of what we'll do in the Dale Carnegie course, those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, we have a class on communication skills. That's the one we're most famous for. Week after week after week, we have our, our participants giving two-minute talks because the typical person only gives you about a two minute time window to get your point across and by then, and if you're talking to high school kids, whew, Allison and I know, they don't even give you two minutes, they give you about 30 seconds, right? And they're on to the, they're on to the next topic. And so we teach that you do need to articula articulate your idea by telling a nice crisp story full of some action and some color and take us back to that incident and then closing with the action and benefit so that they have a nice formula for how to deliver a talk and how to persuade an audience to action. So that's hopefully today was sort of a fun taste for you of what Dale Carnegie training is about. I hope you, you leave some energized with some new ways to handle things. In fact, if you'd like to take a minute, the colorful card that I gave you, I'd like you to make a commitment to one of these principles that you read through today that you feel, gee, you know what, I could probably be a little better at that. For me, it would probably be showing sincere appreciation a little bit more. I think we all probably could do that. Write out that principle on your colorful card. Please write out the principal number and the words to the principal. Thanks for being here today. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, maybe see you again. In the meantime, if you would please turn those in, I'll turn it back over to Allison.